It can be easy to stop noticing our needs when they're being met. When we're hungry, we eat something. When we're tired, we sleep. And when it's cold outside, we put on warm clothes. That makes me think of my friend Carolyn. She has a heart for people and pays attention to the needs of those around her. She notices things that we sometimes don't notice at all. Carolyn is part of a home church that loves serving people. And while many home churches do amazing work with collecting food, volunteering with the elderly, and cleaning up litter on the street, Carolyn's home church was faced with a very different challenge, helping people who don't have the means to stay warm in winter. Lots of kids and youth, and even adults, have to go through cold winters without warm clothes or heating. Especially in Canadian cities, the winter season can be dangerous for those who can't afford warm clothes. So Carolyn and her friends made a decision. They set up in a garage and started collecting coats. They searched through their closets for gently used winter coats that they didn't need anymore. And they asked their friends to do the same. And those people asked their friends for coats. And soon enough, they had more coats than would even fit in a garage. When word got around about the coat drive, a woman reached out to the church asking for help. She couldn't afford a coat for her daughter. And when the winter arrived, her daughter had to go to school in just a sweater. So the church was able to help out because they had all these coats ready for people in need. They gave the woman a coat in her daughter's size, and she was able to stay warm on the way to school each day. The girl felt so proud of the nice winter coat she had received. Carolyn's friends set up a donation box outside the church where people could drop off coats on Sunday morning. After that, the coats were then sorted in a big warehouse by other volunteers. They emptied the bin and started to organize all the coats, making sure that everything was in good condition and sorted into size and gender. Then, a truck brought the clothing from the warehouse over to smaller organizations in nearby cities. The home church was able to partner with five different organizations that knew where the needs were in their community. Those organizations would make sure the coats were brought to people in need. It's important to make people feel valued. The coat drive is for coats that are gently used, clean, and in good condition. It's a chance for Carolyn and her friends to do something good for the community and live out the love of Jesus. And in the first year alone, they collected over 700 coats. That is a lot of coats. You don't always have to go somewhere far away to find people in need. Sometimes the person who needs your help is a friend or a neighbor. It isn't always obvious when someone is going through a difficult time. But my friend Carolyn once told me, if you wanna know where the needs are, just pay attention. Pay attention to those living on the margins, but also to the people around you. You don't necessarily have to donate used clothing. You might have a skill or something else you can give. There are so many opportunities to help people if we just pay attention. And because they paid attention, Carolyn and her friends helped people stay warm. What an incredible way to love their neighbors. They collected gently used coats and sent them to places where they were needed most and literally rescued people from the harsh winter cold. And that makes me think of what Jesus did for us. He paid attention to our needs, showed incredible love, and ultimately gave his life for us so that God could save us through his amazing love. Absolutely right. Oh my goodness, pay attention, pay attention. You never know, if we're not paying attention, we can be oblivious to where the needs are in our personal lives, in our family lives, in our neighborhood lives, in the lives of our city, in the lives of our church. Uh, and I'm so thankful for that reminder of the good things that God by his spirit is stirring up in us as a church. Um, as a reminder, like this is something that has happened uh, uh, locally. So all of the content that you just saw is one of our own stories here uh, at the Meeting House. And that content was developed by our production and curriculum team. So big shout out to them. What an amazing story, a reminder of the love of God to pay attention, to lean into the areas uh, of need that are all around us. Um, yeah, oh, I just love that so much. Um, I would say one of the areas of need that is around us right now uh, in, in this um, 
you know, week, in this moment, in this season as a church, uh, is leaning in and caring for each other well. And one of the ways that we do that, in fact, one of the ways that we are able to produce content and curriculum, um, that video that you just watched, our life story, is what our uh, kids will be engaging with, that Jesus, um, God rescues us through the love of Jesus. Uh, and the reason that, that 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 kind of content is made possible is because of joyful faithful, generous, and consistent giving. And so if you want to know of an area where we can pay attention together as a church, it is in this season right now of giving. Um, we do need to lean in. And so maybe you're in a season right now where you're like, Brother Jimmy, I cannot do it. Not, not able to right now. Grace and peace, where are the areas that you can pay attention in your neighborhood, in your family, in your city to lean into those that are, that are suffering? Um, or maybe in this season, you're one of those who's like, yeah, it's been on pause, like faithfully and joyfully and generously giving has been kind of put on pause for a while. Maybe this is that, that kind word of Jesus by the Spirit in you right now, a reminder to say, yeah, actually, I want to invest in kingdom work and the love of God made tangible and tactile through um, through serving in our community. Uh, and that happens through faithful and joyful and generous giving. Or maybe, um, you know, you're one of those folks who have just continued to give faithfully and generously and joyfully. And this is some of the fruit of that stewardship of getting these kinds of stories out, of telling the good news of God's grace, of us paying attention as a community to, to where we are in our families and our homes and our workplaces and the place that we work and live and play. And so in this moment, I'm just reminded that uh, one, it is easy not to notice when we are, you know, um, eyes down, phones on, it can be easy to not pay attention to those that God has uh, put around us. And so may we be a church that continues to lean in, that continues to lean towards, that gives uh, joyfully, generously, and sacrificially. Um, so there's your sermon before the sermon. Uh, welcome, brothers and sisters. My name is Jimmy. Uh, I'll be hosting our live stream this morning. And uh, we are excited, encouraged, and mindful of uh, the series that we're in. We're going to be jumping in in just a few minutes into our series, Afraid of the Dark, uh, Leaning into the Light as a Church. And that is so fitting for where we are in this moment. So I have a special shout out to you if you're new, if you're checking us out for the first time. Um, you know, maybe say hi in the chat. We've got lots of brothers and sisters who would love to say hi back uh, and get you connected. And if you have any questions, that's a great place to to, to ask those questions. All right, well, we're gonna jump into our music and then our teaching time. Let me, let me offer a quick prayer, uh, and then, uh, like I said, we're gonna jump in. God of grace, we know that by your spirit, you are here, that you are encouraging us to pay attention to the things that you are doing, to the things that you are bubbling up in us. And so as we sing and as we engage in teaching, may we pay attention attention to what you're saying, to the love that you lavish, lavish and, and, and pour out on us, uh, and the ways that you are guiding us and directing us as a church family. We love you, and it is a gift to sing and to learn and to engage in teaching. May your Spirit's presence be felt here and now with us, in us, and through us in Jesus' name. And together we all said, wherever we are, Amen. Let's jump into our music and teaching time. Welcome to the Meeting House. We're so glad you decided to join us today. We're going to um, take part in some musical worship right now. If you'd like, you can stand and join us. And last week I talked about breathing and breath and the word pneuma and how it's the same word for wind and spirit um, and breath. And so one of our team members had said, that was really nice to start with breathing. We should do that every week. So feel free to take a big breath and center yourself, orient yourself around God right now as we spend time worshiping him for who he is because he is worthy.
simple gospel. And God finds us where we are. He meets us where we're at. And we just have to say yes. Just allow him to love us.
Sometimes it's easy to get caught up in thinking that we need to follow rules and have these boundaries so that we don't mess up. But then I think we really miss the point and we miss just being who we are and who God created us to be and all the things that we learn from our mistakes and how we're always, always becoming who God created us to be and we'll never get there, but it's not the point. And so if we make room for mistakes, we make room for God, he'll meet us there. And there's a lesson, and he'll take us deeper into his love, and we'll know him better and know ourselves better. And there's so much value in that. And so we just need to say yes and make room for God to move in our lives in the mess. This is my surrender. This 
is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. Every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender.
You don't think your way into a new kind of living. You live your way into a new kind of thinking. Henry Nowen. May God deliver us from the easygoing, smooth, comfortable Christianity that never lets truth get hold of us. A. W. Tozer. The revolution of Jesus is in the first place and continuously a revolution of the human heart or spirit. It did not and does not proceed by means of the formation of social institutions and laws, the outer forms of our existence, intending that these would then impose a good order of life upon people who come under their power. Rather, his is a revolution of character, which proceeds by changing people from the inside. Dallas Willard. The church can only witness to the truth of Jesus by seeking justice, serving with humility, operating transparently, and confessing and lamenting failures. Scott McKnight. Now then, you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people! Did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? But now, as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor, and everything will be clean for you. Jesus, Luke 11, verses 39 to 41. Come, follow me. Jesus. Well, good morning, church. If those quotes give you any indication, uh, I don't think we're necessarily in for the most lighthearted morning we've ever had together as a church family. And I get the privilege of being the one to lead us through. We're in, a, we're in, in the middle. This is week two of a four-week series uh, about turning the lights on, being a church that lives in the light. So if you're just joining us, uh, you would have missed Quincy last week, kind of positioned for us where we find ourselves. But for the next four weeks, we're on week two. We're tracking through just two chapters of Luke. Uh, so we're not, you know, we're kind of just really sitting with some meaty stuff you can see there. Uh, Quincy got the easy week of talking about how lovely it is when you turn the lights on. I get the week titled Woes and Worries. So if this isn't going to be a party, I don't know what is. But hey, we find ourselves where we find ourselves, and it actually is really important. Quincy did a fantastic job last week starting us off, but he said something in his message that stuck with me and was one of those like, ugh, kind of moments. And he asked this question, and I'm, don't quote me on, I'm paraphrasing a little, but he said, uh, what would get exposed in your life if you turned the lights on? When you turn the lights on fully, what gets exposed? And that's far too convicting of a question, but it's a really good one. And that's one what compelled us to move into this series. Uh, I want to share, and Quincy might have shared this last week too, but the teaching team, which currently uh, is mostly Jimmy, Quincy, myself, along with some others working together, we uh, meet regularly, and we were just praying kind of prior to this series starting and saying, where should we go next? What are we thinking that God's leading us? And we threw around a ton of ideas. Uh, and then we said, let's just spend some time praying and listening. And it was fascinating when we listened and we prayed God really pointed us this way, which really had nothing to do with the things we thought we might talk about. And this is where he took us. And this was weeks ago, prior to receiving more challenging news of a church, of further allegations, an arrest, time together to pull together as a family. And we're really sensing that it's God's timing that has led us here as a church to have an open, honest, and probably tough conversation to ask that question, what gets exposed when we turn on the lights? So that's sort of where we're sitting in, and we're tracking through that. So if you have your Bibles, you can eventually head to Luke 11. But want to start us with something that we talked about last week. And this, I think, is the picture. These are the words of Jesus. This, I think, is the picture of who he's calling us to be as a church, but then also as people who follow him. And in Luke 11:36, Jesus says this, Therefore, if your whole body is full of light and no part of it dark, it will be just as full of light as when a lamp shines its light on you. This is the picture of the potential of who we are when we're in Christ. That whether we have the lights on or we don't, our entire being is filled with light so that when the light does get turned on, it's as bright as it was as if a lamp was shining on you. 
So this is where we started last week. And this week we're sort of looking at the contrast of that as we continue in the story. The verses we're looking at today are Luke 11, 37 to 54. And it's right after Jesus says these words, he continues in his ministry and he heads to a Pharisee's house for dinner. And we're about to see laid before us the contrast of when this isn't happening. When people aren't fully living in the light. And I think there will be some things for us to process as a church and as individuals. And so we're going to start there and we're going to read the first few verses there. You can read along on the slide or if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke 11, 37. We're going to read the first few verses there. It says, when Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. But the Pharisee was surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not first wash his hands before the meal. Then the Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people, did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? But now, as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor, and everything will be clean for you. And so Jesus wastes no time. Here's where it gets good. Here's where it like instantly gets spicy. Jesus goes to a Pharisee's house for dinner and what's the first thing he does? He like blows past the ritual that they would have had prior to eating together, which would have been a ritual of cleansing. I said hand washing, but it would have been a more full ritual of cleansing. And the Pharisee notices this right away. And here's the thing. I want us to sit here for a minute because there's some significance to what Jesus does. This, I want to just preface. This whole passage is uncomfortable, much more so for the Pharisees than maybe for us today. But this was not comfortable. And Jesus sets the tone right away by blowing past the ritual they would have had. And here's why it's so significant. So the Pharisees, if you're not familiar, were the people who were the keepers of the law and the rule. They were the ones of the highest status of keeping to the religious law of the day. They would have been wealthy, would have, they would have been high in status, and they were the ones to hold to the law. And these were also the ones that consequently kept finding ways to trap Jesus, trick Jesus, and move him towards his ultimate death. And so when Jesus doesn't do the ritual that they do, they pay attention. But here's the thing about this ceremonious hand cleaning, this cleansing, is that it wasn't even just a law. By this point, the Pharisees had gone above and beyond what the law would have even stated around cleansing to create even more of a ritual and a tradition that they wanted to hold to. It's almost like the Pharisees couldn't get enough of rigidity, so they took the law and then they added their own layers onto it. And so they weren't even just keeping the law anymore, they were going above and beyond that to say, here are the very hard boundary lines of what it means to be right, what it means to be in versus out, and we expect everyone to do them. In Mark, one of the other Gospels, you see this explained and expanded upon a bit, and in Mark chapter three, or chapter 7, I should say, verses 3 and 4. Jesus, this is what it says about that, this idea of cleansing. It says, The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So Mark is painting a bit of a picture of what this ritual would have looked like for them. You can see the process that it would have taken simply to sit down and eat. But what's interesting is if you follow along in this Mark passage just a few verses later, you see Jesus call out for them there as well, how they've gone above and beyond what God ever asked of them in the law. In verse 9, right after these verses, he says to the Pharisees, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. Jesus is saying them to them, You have this fine way of setting aside what God has called you to, to hold at a higher level your own traditions, rituals, and expectations. And so Jesus is pressing into the Pharisees by his words in Mark, but now by his actions, by saying this isn't necessary. This isn't necessary to follow God. The ritual of hand washing was a religious expectation, and Jesus walks right past that expectation. And here's where I want us to pause first. I know we're only a few verses in, but man, does this ever set the scene. 
I want us to think for a minute about this idea of religious expectation. Where have we maybe held traditions higher than what God has asked of us? Where do we find comfort, speaking as a church, speaking as people who follow Jesus, where have we found comfort in a ritual or a tradition that perhaps has pulled us away from the actual words that God has spoken to us about how we're meant to live? Was it a bad thing that the Pharisees were washing their hands? No. What made it go from simply a ritual to landing in uh, a heart posture that wasn't good was that associated with it was now a pride. That if you don't do this, we get to judge you. (laughs) If you don't do it this way, clearly you're not as religious as we are. Jesus always, in his life and in his ministry, walked past the expectations that people had made to point to the truth and the words of what God says. Where have we held to traditions higher than the words that God has spoken to us? And even more so, I just want to ask, where have we maybe set religious expectations? Where have we set religious expectations that we're so used to doing that we say, this is just how we do it. This is just how it has to be. But when we actually walk it back, does it align with the heart and the posture of the way of Jesus? And since we're sitting in a morning that I've already said maybe feels a little more uncomfortable, I want to push us just a little bit further. Speak as your senior pastor for a minute and say, where have we as the meeting house maybe built traditions or religious expectations that aren't actually the way of Jesus? And maybe they've been done with the best of intentions and with fruit born out of them. But over time, they potentially have become a normative way of doing things and have pulled us away from the gentle voice of Jesus calling us a different way. And so I just want to say I'm sorry if in any way that has been your experience, likely not intentionally, of saying what it means to go to church, what it means to go to the meeting house is this. And it's probably really good. But where do we maybe need to pause and say, is that an expectation or a tradition that actually has pulled us away from the simple message that Jesus has for us. So that's just the first couple verses of Jesus' interaction with the Pharisees. Before supper even starts, he makes it clear to them that he's not here to play nice. And he calls out in them and says, you wash the outside and yet the inside is filled with greed and darkness. He calls them out for why holding this man-made ritual is false and is hypocritical. The outside looks clean, but the inside is filled with darkness. And so let's go back to that passage in 36 for a second where he says your whole being can be filled with light so that even if a lamp shines on you, it will be light. That's the picture of who he calls his followers to be. And just a few verses later, he is challenging and rebuking a group of people who claim to be the most religious. And he says, that is not you. You work so hard to keep the outside clean, and the inside is full of darkness. Specifically here, he says that is uh, greed and wickedness. But we can call it darkness. It's almost like Jesus could ask that question of them. If I was to shine a light on you, what would actually be exposed? within you here. So let's continue. They probably haven't even eaten by this point. Jesus is really pressing into them, and then he just continues. He starts to call out warnings. These are the woe to use, and I want us to sit here for a minute as we just walk through the passage. The next three verses say this, verses 42 to 44 say, woe to you Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and all kinds of other garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Woe to you Pharisees because you love the most important seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you because you are like unmarked graves which people walk all over without knowing it. Jesus came to play. I want to process some of these, and simply that word woe, uh, in this context, in the original language, it's, it's almost like it had an, I'm not going to get this word wrong, an automatic, automatopoeic feel to it. It was like a groan, like a woe, a woe to you. And this wasn't 
This was a warning. This was a rebuke. This was a call of distress. This wasn't simply Jesus sitting over here with a higher status, throwing down uh, cynicism or skepticism or disdain. This was a lament and a distress and a warning saying, because of how you're choosing to live out your religious way of being, there is a warning, there is a woe. So feel that as you hear Jesus rebuke these Pharisees over and over. And I want to summarize some of these things here. I think they can be summarized kind of with these three things. That first woe says, you're so good to give a tenth of your garden, a tenth of everything you do. You know how to follow the law down to the minuscule last measurement. But you have not shown justice, mercy, and love to those who need it. This is, a, this is a common refrain of the Pharisees that they often valued the law so much more highly than they valued love. And I think that's what we can take from it. These rebukes are relatively specific to the Pharisees at the time. I'm not sure anyone out here feels convicted when they hear that you've only given a tenth of the mint from your garden. If that's you today, hear that. Maybe that's the word for you today. But I think what we can take from this today is this idea of a heart posture that says there is a focus on the law over the love of Jesus. And this was Jesus' consistent message and what rubbed the Pharisees the wrong way over and over and over again. And he says, woe to you. There is a warning here because it isn't about just that. If you do that but forsake the other, you've missed the entire point of what it means to follow after God. The second woe he gives them or calls out in them is that he says, you love these places of status. You love the grandiose greetings in the marketplace. You love the special seats in the synagogue. And the Pharisees held a value of status over serving. Again, while I know that sometimes in church we tend to have like a seat that we really like and it may throw us off if when we show up on Sunday someone else might be sitting in that seat, I don't actually think any of us need to feel convicted about that idea of where's the special status seat for me at church. But what we can hear as we look at how Jesus gives warning and rebuke to the Pharisees is this idea of status over serving. They, they valued so much more deeply and highly appearing that outward appearance, right, of value, status, and getting it right. And for us, I sometimes wonder the same. The serving is the hard part. The doing the work of walking alongside and being with and showing compassion and being with the broken and working toward justice, that's the hard work. Frankly, sometimes I think it's easier for me to stand up on the stage with words that tend to come easy to me than it is to sit with my neighbor that I did this week who's really going through a hard time. You know what I was thinking when I sat with my neighbor in my backyard as she was going through a hard time was, I got a sermon to prep. (laughs) That's me getting it wrong. (laughs) Uh, And it was a sacred time with her. But uh, this was a woe and a warning to the Pharisees from Jesus. And then that third warning I want us to land on a little bit. He says, Woe to you, because this this would have sat with the Pharisees in a big way. Woe to you, because you are like unmarked graves. Now, we may miss over that. That may seem like a, okay, I don't really get what that means, but this would have been a very specific jab to the Pharisees, because this was a part of their law. If you're super curious or want to do some more study, in Numbers uh, 19, verse 16, it talks about the rule of uh, interaction with uh, dead people Uh, with the dead, with graves, and how to have any crossover or any interaction would have caused a person to be unclean for seven days. And so part of what they did to abide by this law was to mark as many graves as they could with a whitewash so that there could be an intentional avoidance of the graves. Because the minute you cross over or walk over or cross into path with, there's there's an uncleanliness for a week And so what Jesus is saying here is, you Pharisees are like the unmarked graves. And what he's he's pushing them to is to say, because you've got it wrong, because you focus so much on what your outside looks like and yet your inside is full of darkness, as you lead people and tell them to follow you because you've got it right, when people follow you, when people hear your words, it's like you're the unmarked grave and you have now made them unclean. You have called them into an imitation of you that has made them unclean. The Pharisees would have held to such a high, pious level of uh, 
perf of getting it right, of perfection, of thinking they had it figured out because they were such the keepers of the law. And so this would have dug at them in a specific way when Jesus says, you've got it totally wrong. And in doing what you're doing, you're making people spiritually unclean. And I want us, this is the second spot I want us to kind of pull out of the passage and talk about that for a minute, this idea of unclean imitation. When, when we ask you to imitate us and not Jesus, we are like unmarked graves because it's only Jesus. It can only be Jesus who we ever point to, who we ever ask you to look like, who we ever call you to become more and more like. And yet I think sometimes unintentionally we put ourselves in that space and say, come look like us. And so we're sorry for any of the times that we've put ourselves as your leaders in the way of you actually seeing the fullness of Jesus. Even unintentionally, unintentionally. We do what we do and we steward our gifts and we stand before you as your pastors and your leaders, but the entire purpose and heart and goal is so that more fully all of us on an equal field see Jesus. And since we're in a season of repentance as a church and turning the lights on, I do want to name that. And maybe that's not been your experience in my prayer, and my hope is that not, that your experience of this place and this church is that Jesus has shone so fully for you every time. But for any of the ways that it's felt more like I should look like my pastor, I should look like my leader, we say sorry. Because that's an unclean imitation, and our heart and our hope is that we just send you to Jesus over and over. And so that's, I, I wanted to take a minute and just say that piece, and I'd also just want you to say on your own, where do you maybe just have an internal uh, like leaning or propensity to imitate the person that is leading you? We all do it, because there's good things, what, and maybe not even in, in the church context, but in other places. We want to emulate and take on characteristics that we see that, that are good, and that we want to strive to be like. But take a minute and just do a heart inventory to, to think about the ways that maybe the person that has been leading you spiritually, uh, they've been the one that you want to look like. And say, how do I shift from letting them walk alongside me in discipleship so that together we just continue to look more and more like Jesus? Um, as we continue in this passage, there's a line that, if, if we didn't think Jesus was uh, really pressing in, I think this next verse, it kind of makes me chuckle, but verse 45, after he like presses in, presses in, presses in, one of the leaders of the law says to Jesus, teacher, when you say these things, you insult us. I mean, I'm, that, that's my own inflection. The scriptures, did. <laughs> he maybe wasn't quite so whiny, but there was a stop of like, this is really hard to hear. And it, at this point, you think maybe Jesus would have like backed up a bit and been like, ah, okay, well, let, me, let me gently come around you. But he doesn't do that. He says, oh, oh yeah, you guys, I've got some warnings for you too. <laughs> and that's what the rest of this passage is, is there's three more woes to the keepers of the law who were different than the Pharisees, but very much in partnership. These were the people together that were leading the way and modeling the way for what it meant to follow God and follow religion. And he goes on to do a, a several more woe to use. We don't have time to go through each one of them uh, today. In home church, you're going to take a bit of a closer look at that. So if you're in home church, you'll have a chance to chew on those. And I just want to say, for those of you that aren't in home church and you hear us say, in home church, you're going to, in home church, you're going to, uh, hey, find a home church. They're a great opportunity for community, but also... I would just say those, those questions are available for you too. They're just attached to the teaching notes that you can find online. Grab a friend this week. Process some of those home church questions together uh, to continue in just wrestling with what we find in this passage of scripture. So while we can't do all of them, I just want to highlight uh, the first woe that Jesus gives the keepers of the law. In verse 46, Jesus says this. Jesus replied, and you experts in the law, woe to you. Because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry. And you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. Here we see the heart of Jesus come through. 
he calls out to them and says, you've made this way of trying to follow God so heavy, so burdensome, so uh, hard to get right. And that's not the way of Jesus. And so just want to speak that truth for you today that the way of Jesus isn't meant to be a burden. The way of Jesus isn't meant to pull you down and have you feel and sense that I just didn't get it right. Jesus says in Matthew, he says, my way is easy, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And let's name that we're in a hard season as a church. So if you just need to hear the truth this morning that the way of Jesus is easy because he carries things along with us, know that that is true. And he wants to carry whatever burden along with you. All right, as we move to just kind of closing things up today. I just want to name, I know this is a bit of a heavier passage of scripture, but as we take seriously the words of Jesus, we want to sit with these two. Jesus had heavy, stern, firm words for the Pharisees because they weren't matching up to that picture of light that I pointed to at the beginning of the message that Jesus said. They weren't matching up their actions with the words that they were saying. Jesus knew the internal posture of their hearts and that they had no desire to shift internally and become transformed. He has strong words. He calls them hypocrites. In another passage, he calls them a brood of vipers. He doesn't soften his words. And while this applies specifically to the Pharisees, there are some things for us too. And it's not a word of condemnation. The last thing I would want is for us to walk out of here and think that the thing Jesus has for you is a bunch of woes, warnings, and worries. Because that is not the heart of Jesus. Jesus pressed into the Pharisees because he knew their heart posture. But when Jesus speaks to us, it's not a word of condemnation. Maybe some conviction. There may be some things that you hear and say, "There, there are some areas that Jesus might be pulling into me in conviction. But what you need, but what I hope you hear more is a comforting word that the way of Jesus isn't a way of hypocrisy. Isn't a way of willingly and fully going forward, speaking words of religion and a way of following God, but intentionally having an inside that is still filled with darkness. Hear the difference between being made to feel guilty for and when we sin, and we're all going to sin. We're all going to miss the mark. We're all going to have those pieces of us that we don't want to turn the lights on of. But what Jesus has for us isn't condemnation. What he has for us is a call to be like verse 36. To say this is my intention for you and this is a potential for you because you're my child. Because you follow me, my spirit is in you, my light will shine through you. And every time we're tempted to turn to the darkness, we have a way to turn back to the light. We've talked a lot in this season as a church about repentance. Repentance is a turning it's a, it's a saying, I'm not just saying I'm sorry, it's that I'm changing how I am. And so for all of us, there's pieces of us that maybe you'd say, Jesus might want to call out a woe and a warning. He doesn't. What he calls out for you is a repent and come back to the light. We are a people of light, and our desire is to be a church that lives in the light, and that is the work we're doing. We are not condemned. We are called into the beautiful picture of who we can be because Jesus is in us and is the one who leads us. And as we wrap up, um, just want to say your experience and story of the church, this church, other churches, may be one that has experiences of hypocrisy. But hear me say that this is not the way of Jesus. Jesus. And let me give a gentle encouragement to separate as best you can those experiences with the truth of who God is. Because Jesus had no space for hypocrisy and hypocrites either. He has all the space in the world for people striving to turn toward the light. And that's who we are as a church, is striving to turn toward the light. I want to call up Rob, and as Rob comes up, and I'll explain in a minute who Rob is, I was just praying about, uh, as we sit in this uh, message today as a church, as individuals too, we always hold the words of scripture to say, Jesus, what do you have for me? Um, The one thing that I just felt challenged by as I prayed was, Jesus say, 
uh, not out of condemnation, but out of a sense of as we walk through this hard season as a church, almost like a woe to you, church, if you try to do this journey on your own strength. My hope and my heart for us as a church is that as we walk this extremely hard road with really hard things, is that we don't get to the end of this, whenever the end of this is, and realize that we just did it on our own strength, that we tried so hard to manage and get the words right and do the right step after step after step in the right order. We can try as hard as we want, and we will get some stuff wrong. But the one thing we can do is to be a church that prays. And that's what I sense Jesus say to us, is be a church that is a praying church through this season. And so I've invited Rob, Rob Harshman, he's one of our Oakville Parish community members, and he's someone who has been participatory and uh, a key leader in the prayer ministry here at the church. And I wanted him to just share for just a few minutes on what God has put on his heart, which I think could potentially turn into a call for us as a church, as we say, what, so what do we take from this message? What do we sense God is saying to us? What could Jesus be rebuking in us to turn more and more towards the light? Rob. Thank you, Carmen. About four and a half months ago, I began to experience a new understanding of prayer. And I was really, really frustrated and up against a bit of a brick wall. And so one night I prayed, I said, Father, I don't know where to go or what to do. So I, I need you to speak to me. Even if it's the middle of the night, it doesn't really matter. I need to hear from you. A Couple of nights later, I woke up in the middle of the night and these words came to me, pray for the church, pray for the church, pray for the church. I couldn't get it out of my mind. And, and so I began to take that seriously and a couple of days later, this came to me, this question, do you love the church? I said, yeah, I love the church. Pray for the church. And, I, and so I began to. I began to pray for the church. I began to pray for every aspect of the church that I could think of. But then I realized that this was mostly a prayer from here, not a prayer from here. And a short while later, I was watching, listening to Brian Dirksen uh, singing Today. Today is the day I choose to follow you. And as I was sitting there and as I was listening to this, my eyes began to fill and I realized I had to pray from here. I had to pray from deep inside myself. I had to pray from the deep part of me so that God could use my prayers to do what he needs to do. And as I began to do that, my prayer life began to transform. And then I began to, to have images or, or visions, I guess, of people praying all over. It started with seeing people pray here, little groups of people, many in tears, praying for a church. And then I, then I saw people in homes and in backyards praying for our church. And then this came to me the prayers of a hundred. And it was that we need people, I believe in my heart, we need at least a hundred people who will pray all across our church, all the different parishes who pray for our church every day. Because that, my friends, is what is going to get us through this. What, we may, what we're facing may seem impossible, but I believe that God has given us enough promises for us to believe that he's going to take us through. He's going to lead us through whatever we're in. And when I committed to pray for the church every day, I said, Lord, I don't know what's going to come up. I don't know what we're facing. I don't know what tomorrow is going to be. This is two and a half months ago. But whatever it is, I commit to pray for this church because I love it. And so I want to share that with you today. Maybe it resonates with you, but that's where I'm at. I am committed to pray for this church because I love it and because it's my church. Thanks, Rob. Uh, and so the, the call is to, to all of us 
Can we be a church in this season? Always, but in this season that is praying. Mm. And this likely will take some formal shape. We don't have anything that says like, we'll sign up here and join the team. That may come. We're sensing what God is pushing us into to say this is how we walk through this together. So stay tuned. But also like if this is pinging for you, uh, just hear that call to step in in maybe a more intentional way to in this season be praying for our church. Rob, I wonder if you can just equip us with just like, what are some things then all of us can be praying for as we are church together? Well, first, based upon my experience, we need to uh, allow God to go through our heart and clean out stuff, attitudes and behaviors and stuff that just aren't pleasing to him. But I think we also need to be praying for the direction of our church and for our leaders. And maybe you're involved, maybe you have children who are involved in the children's ministry. Pray for them. Pray for every aspect of the church that God lays on your heart. Everything. And my firm belief is there is nothing that goes on in a church that shouldn't be prayed for. Everything. And the sky is the limit on that. That's amazing. Thank you, Rob, for sharing a bit of your heart and what God has put there. And so as we close, let's pray together. God, we submit to you, and we looked today at a passage that held heavy, hard words for a group of people that were intentionally holding a heart posture of pride and a heart posture of focusing on the wrong things. And my call is that we as a church don't emulate that in any way, but that we have a posture of humility, a posture that says our desire is to be in the light in every possible way. Thank you, Jesus, that yours for us is a voice of conviction and gentle call back to who we are truly meant to be. And God, in this season, may we be a church that prays. By your spirit, put on our heart that reminder, that conviction, that compelling from within to pray for your church, to pray for all of the things we're holding and facing together, that we would do that by following your leadership and praying to you, asking for your favor, asking for your healing, asking for your reconciliation, asking for your wisdom, asking for your boldness to call out the dark places and own them and repent of them. All of that, Jesus, we submit to you. This is your church and we follow your leading. And we pray this in your name, amen. Amen, thanks Carmen and thanks Rob. Um, certainly a lot there. Uh, we also recognize that for some of us um, on the live stream, maybe you've tuned in for the first time and you're a little foggy on like, what is it that we're talking about? Why this series? What's going on? And so we just want to be very specific that, uh, you know, we are moving along in grief, um, in stress and in pain together as a church, intentionally leaning in and on each other. But what specifically can we be praying about? I mean, maybe for that, like even, even that phrase for you is, it feels cumbersome. So like, what is prayer? What does that mean? Is that like an eyes closed, good sentence or two that we offer up into the cosmos to God, hoping that he listens? Yes and no. I mean, prayer is the active experience of our bodies, of attuning to the heart and mind, of slowing down and attuning to the heart and mind of God, knowing that always his heart and mind are attuned to us. It's like removing the clutter so that we can hear and center and communicate with God, expecting and knowing that he communicates with us and wants to guide and direct. As we were praying this morning before we began, uh, like our weekend experience, uh, one of our um, uh, leaders here uh, said something that has just stuck with me, that God moves slow. God moves slow slow. And so for us in this moment and time, uh, season of our church, we want to move slow with and for each other, connecting with and for each other and supporting each other. And so um, the news of this week of hearing about uh, ongoing allegations and investigations of Brexy, our former teaching pastor's arrest, of uh, you know the continuing investigation about Tim Day, our for former senior pastor, uh, and also um, uh, other allegations and investigations that we continue to press into as a church. Our desire is not to shield or to cover up or to put away, but to lean fully in. Uh, and even I've had a couple uh, emails and conversations this week from people outside of our community that are like, how tone deaf is this series? Uh, you know, being afraid of, the uh, afraid of the dark, being a church that lives in the light, like, isn't that what you're not doing? And so this is intentional. We want to lean into the series 
and, and the season as a church saying, God, we are willing, open, and receiving how it is that you're rebuking, correcting, but also leaning us into supporting, caring for each other well, and being the most honest and transparent version of ourselves. And I think one of those opportunities was this past week we had our community gathering, and maybe you were able to take part in that, whether in person or online. Uh, but if you weren't, we would love for you to still to uh, take part. And so we're going to drop right below me here. You'll see the link for um, this past week's community gathering. Uh, the information is all there and we'll also drop it in the chat. Please, please uh, take a look at that. Um, it was a heavy time, but I think a very powerful and intentional time for us as a church community to lean into specifics of what has happened, what is happening now, and where are we headed as a church. Uh, and if I think if I were to summer, like, summarize, you know, where are we heading as a church, it's that we need to be a church that slows down, that moves at the pace of God, that, that attunes our hearts and minds to what God is saying, knowing that God is speaking to us. And so just like we started this morning, pay attention. Pay attention to the needs that are around you. May we be a church in this day, uh, in this week, in this season that leans into the light of God, that exposes darkness, but also restores our souls. And so wherever you find yourself today, may you experience the light, the grace, the peace, the love of God in the place where you work, play, and live. And may the grace of God go with you and with me and with us. And so... I hope you enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Uh, we love you. Uh, God loves you. And we'll see you next time.